Disruption and radical change have become an entrenched part of the business landscape. From here, capturing growth opportunities involving your business amid uncertainty relies on keeping pace with emerging trends. Welcome to the ComBank Foresight webinar series, designed to equip businesses with the insights and tools to support your vision for the future. To do this, the series will bring leading experts and businesses together to examine the forces reshaping business strategies and consumer behaviour. Over four sessions, we'll explore the pathways to adopting sustainable and socially responsible business practices as an avenue to build resilience and growth. We'll also seek to demystify the impact and value of social purpose in the eye of consumers. With the digital economy gaining prominence, we'll shine a spotlight on cybersecurity and keeping your data and business safe. In turn, it's becoming increasingly important to maximise the use of data and AI to power better business decisions and connect with customers on their terms. We'll look at how you can make this happen. So thank you for joining us to examine the latest research, insights and perspectives that we hope help you plan more confidently for a brighter future. Well, thank you, Mark, and good day, everyone. Welcome to this, the third webinar in the ComBank Foresight series, um, aimed at giving you tools and insights to help you achieve your vision. Now, this session is all about social purpose. Why? Well, in the last uh, Consumer Insights research that we performed right in the middle of the pandemic, we discovered that um, we started to look inside ourselves a little bit more um, and we're asking more of the businesses that, uh, that we do business with. Uh, and hence social purpose came out as something that was important for our consumers. I was pleased to see that um, at a recent summit on retail and another one uh, on hospitality, social purpose was there sort of underpinning the whole conversation. So it's a very uh, present topic for us to be discussing. Now, we've done some research, um, as we always do and have been doing for the last six or seven years into retail and consumers. Um, and we've researched five and a half thousand consumers uh, around social purpose most recently. What I've discovered in those six or seven years of research is that that research only takes you so far. There's always another question that you want to ask when you see the answers to those questions. And the best way to fill in the gaps is actually to have some experts along with you to be able to, uh, to, to fill those gaps in for you. Um, and that's where we have two speakers here, Andrew Davies, who is the chief executive um, of B-Lab. Um, B-Lab is a global uh, not-for-profit organization uh, which aims to uh, transform the global economy by benefiting people, communities, and the planet. Um, and B-Lab uh, certifies organizations who become known as uh, B Corps um, that meet the highest standards of social environmental performance, accountability, and transparency. Um, and then we have Abdullah Rame. Uh, Abdullah is the CEO of Pablo and Rusty's Coffee Roasters. Um, not only are they a B Corp, um, but they're also carbon neutral certified and they're a specialty roaster and wholesaler of, uh, of coffee beans based here in, uh, in Sydney. Now you might notice that uh, there are more Y chromosomes uh, on the panel than we would normally uh, hope to have. Um, but I've got to, uh, to let you know that behind the scenes, it's not just us, um, we're just the front people. Um, behind the scenes is a big team bringing these to you and there's uh, uh, much more diversity in that team. Uh, and indeed within the research that we've got, we've got that broken down by gender um, for you as, as well. Now I'm coming to you today uh, from uh, from Gadigal land, um, land traditionally cared for by the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in Sydney. I have to say that uh, they've I really respect and admire the way that they have cared for the land over millennia, um, and uh, I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, and as we're on a webinar, I can I also pay my respects to all of the um, Indigenous elders on whatever lands we're meeting on today. And if there are any uh, Indigenous or Torres Strait Islands peoples with us today, then you're very, very welcome. Now let's move to the, uh, to the research. 
Uh, you'll find that the research can be, can be downloaded online um, from our website. This is the, uh, the URL for it here. Um, please do download it. It includes our research, also includes interviews uh, with Andrew and Abdullah. Um, so there is absolutely no reason for you to uh, worry about taking screenshots, noting things down or whatever. Um, the main points are in that, uh, in that, in that piece of research. So please do uh, sit back and, uh, and enjoy the, uh, the next hour. So what is purpose, first of all? Um, well, it's about why we do what we do, um, aside from a commercial benefit. It's not necessarily that we sell suits, for example, but it's that we make men feel comfortable in social situations, let's say. Um, so it's that kind of thing, what's our purpose? And here are some that um, I found on the web for some well-known organizations. So uh, Walmart, for example, says they save people money so that they can live better. Alibaba is about making it easier to do business everywhere. And Patagonia, who we might come back to later, um, are about saving our home planet. Here are some more. Lush, creating a cosmetics revolution. And Adore Beauty, which I like, is to help women feel more confident and fabulous every day. And you see that with having that kind of a, a purpose, um, they can expand what they do away from not just providing uh, cosmetics, which they've traditionally done and do fantastically well, but into other categories as well. And then, of course, there's Combank, building a brighter future for all. But when it comes to a social purpose, that's another extension on top of it. And here is a definition that um, a Canadian company uh, has provided. A business with a social purpose is a company whose enduring reason for being is to create a better world. It's an engine for good, creating societal benefits by the very act uh, of conducting business. Its growth is a positive force for society. B-Lab, a little more concise, a little easier to remember, using business as a force for good. And I think it's important to say here, as a conversation I had with Abdullah uh, last week uh, informed, this isn't about being a charity. This is about being a business, providing um, goods and services to people, but also making sure that there is an underlying purpose in there that is a force for good. So remember I said that we had interviewed five and a half thousand uh, uh, customers along with uh, our research partner, ACA Research. And what they found was when they, we asked the question, what's the number one priority for you when you decide where to buy something from? Then value for money was absolutely the biggest one. Um, quality of products was next and then convenience, good customer service. But you can see that having a strong social purpose was only the number one priority for just 4% of the people that were interviewed. So we should perhaps stop there, shouldn't we? We're just about 10 minutes into the, into the, uh, uh, the, the talk. There's only 4% of people interested. Why are we here? Well, that would be uh, a, um, a, 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 the wrong thing to do, uh, given that that's when we ask them a question about what's the main priority. And when people think about that, then they give us 4%. Actually, there's a lot more to it than that. So let's delve into it a little bit, little bit more. We asked people about how they interacted with social comments on websites and from businesses. And we found that 14% of people were proactive. They actually actively looked out uh, comments on social purpose um, on companies' websites and so on. 45% um, didn't necessarily look it out, but they engaged with it when they came across it. And just 41% are disengaged. It's, in, um, it's instructive to look at who those people are. When we look at this from a gendered point of view, we find that there's actually not much difference. Um, in fact, males are more likely to be proactive than females. They're also more likely to be disengaged as well. But the difference isn't strong. Um, and the same with whether people are um, living in a metro area or whether they're living in a regional area. Where it really does differ, though, is in age. And you can see that Gen Z, Gen Y are very much more proactively engaged with, um, with social commentary on websites, social purpose um, there, than older consumers are. And when we break it down based on those that are proactive, those that are engaged and those that are disengaged in terms of what's the primary reason for you shopping somewhere, you'll see that it jumps up for strong social purpose. Those who are proactive say the most important thing for me over all other things is, is actually having a strong social purpose. 11% say that. 
Something else that's important as well, we asked the question, what's the number thing, one thing that you would um, focus on if you wanted to enhance your reputation? And we found that 9% of people said that having a strong social purpose was a good driver of enhancing your reputation uh, as well. Okay, so we've got to the point here where we know that um, a small number of people say when asked, yes, social purpose is the most important thing for me. Um, when we look at those people who are engaged in social purpose, generally those who are younger, so if that's your demographic, then think about your social purpose. It's more important to your customers than it is to others. Um, and uh, we know that that then sort of jumps up to around 10%. But these are based on very, very pointed questions. Um, when we look at uh, more nuanced questions, as we've got here on the screen, I'm sorry for the for the uh, the small font, but you'll see that um, many more people say that they're proud to be associated with brands who share their values. For example, that's 45 percent. And when we look a bit further down, people are more forgiving um, for businesses with a strong social purpose. 35 percent actively seek out businesses uh, that strongly align with their values. Um, and we find that people regularly shop from businesses solely because of the, uh, their, their social purpose. Well, 35% of people said that they do that too. So although we boldly say, no, no, social purpose isn't the most important thing for me, a lot of people are engaging with it um, in the background, almost subliminally, um, as we see from these, uh, from these statements here. Now we've broken these, uh, these comments down into category as well. Um, and as we can see here, where we look at retail, fast food, hospitality, it's actually more likely that people are going to say, I'm really proud to be associated with a hospitality brand who shares my values, or um, I'm really pleased and have supported businesses that stayed open, for example, and supported the community um, during the pandemic. Uh, also, purpose-led businesses much more likely to care about me and my family. That's the thought um, around hospitality, more so than retail, and definitely more so than, than fast food, where we appear to have less of a, um, a, an expectation of looking after social purpose there. Which means that things like this are very important. This is my local um, bar a couple of years ago during the, uh, the, the bushfires and they were giving 100% of their revenue from the, uh, from the afternoon to bushfire uh, appeals. That's going to resonate well with, uh, with customers. So well done to the, uh, to the local small bar. They also make a pretty good gin and tonic. Now, let's take a look at some other things around, uh, around social purpose and particularly price. Um, because I think there's a feeling that perhaps having a social purpose adds a layer of cost and therefore that's a layer of cost that I need to recover. Remember we talked before, we're not talking about being a charity, we're talking about being a, uh, a business with a social purpose. Um, and uh, we asked questions around price and found that 53% of people are prepared to pay more to purchase a product from a purpose-led business. So over half of us, and that's all of us, it's not just those who engage with social purpose, 53% of all of us have said that we're prepared to pay more. And interestingly, of that 53%, almost a third of them, 30 odd percent, 31% there, um, say they'll pay more than 10% premium to shop with a company that has a strong social purpose. There is a rider on that though. As you can see here, um, we asked the question, have you, uh, do you often not buy pr uh, products from, from organizations with a social purpose because the products are too expensive? And you can see the numbers here are up in the 30s, 40s, and even 50% for fashion. So um, although a lot of us are happy to pay more for uh, a, a, um, a product that comes from an organization that has a social purpose, often we find that the price is too rich for us um, and therefore we go elsewhere. And that's not the only challenge that people have around social purpose. As we see here with this graph, on the left-hand side, 55% of people believe that actually, although there might be a social purpose baked into a business, it's actually not their main focus of the business and they're actually about making money. So quite a lot of cynicism around, uh, around social purpose and social intent there. Only 11% of people actually disagreed with that, uh, with that statement. Most people were either saying, uh, agreeing with it or were neutral on it. We also find that around half of us believe that brands shouldn't be focusing their products and services, well, should be focusing on products and services rather, and should be leaving social and environmental issues to the government to sort out. And 36% of us feel that brands are actually intruding too far into our lives. So let's 
just unpack that um, a little bit more. The next slide is a little busy. It's a heat map. Um, and across the top, you'll see we have all of the categories of, or the main categories of retail, running from groceries on the left-hand side across the recreational goods on the right. And then down the, uh, the page, we've got a number of social um, causes that we might be involved with for at the top, for example, fair employment practices, um, reduction in packaging, um, supporting local communities are all there. And you'll see that those are all there green, many of them dark green. So people feel that those are things that are really important um, for businesses to focus on pretty much whatever the, the, the retail category they are in. Um, interestingly, uh, health and beauty, very dark green. Then 90% of people think that they should focus more on reduction of packaging um, and uses of plastic. Um, and so if they did that, had a social purpose around that, um, then that's likely to go well with their, with their customers. The deep reds in the middle are where people have um, have said, no, no, that's not something that I would expect of this particular category. Um, and you'll see healthy living, for example, is something that uh, the motive parts retailers are not expected to, uh, to, to engage in to any great extent. Now, if I move to the next page, you'll see this is now for hospitality, the same method being used here, same categories down the left-hand side of the page, but we look at fast food, restaurants and cafes, pubs and clubs across the top. And there's a big green streak across the middle that we didn't see there for uh, retailers, and that's around food waste reduction and food security. Um, very important for us, perhaps obviously within, within, uh, within hospitality. But again, a focus on that, a focus of making sure we're not wasting our, um, uh, our food. We're making sure that any food left over at the end of the day goes to the homeless, for example, something like that, will be well picked up and well received by customers um, of hospitality venues. So let's just unpack that um, a little more. And here we've got the website of the Body Shop. Body Shop for says forever against animal testing. Um, and as long as I've known the Body Shop when I was in, living in the UK and, and now living here in Australia, um, the Body Shop has always, always, always had a cause of making sure that none of the, the um, uh, the cosmetics and so on that they that they sell um, are tested on animals. So that lives for them very well as a social purpose. And you'll see when we look at health and beauty as the category, uh, we find that 80% of people are very happy with um, animal protection, um, reduction in animal cruelty being a social purpose that those in health and beauty have. So that makes sense. It fits. Um, Probably doesn't rock the boat, uh, particularly for them, but it's the right thing for them to be to be focused on. Now, this is um, a snapshot from the Patagonia website. You remember them? We we talked about them at the uh, at the top of the uh, the program. We talked about uh, them wanting to save our home planet. Um, this is about them keeping the Tonglas roadless. Now, the Tonglas is um, in Alaska. It is one of the what well, is the, the 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 largest untouched temperate rainforests in the world. Um, one of the last acts, I think, of Bill Clinton was to put an act through to make sure that the Tonglas um, and other. Uh, national parks were kept roadless um, for the obvious reason that if you put a road through, then logging becomes almost the next thing to do. Um, one of Donald Trump's uh, activities was to actually try and roll that back. And so that's why Patagonia um, have got a cause here of keeping the Tonglas uh, roadless, keeping uh, keeping that, uh, that, that, that bill from being repealed. And you'll see that 77% view recre in recreational goods, uh, having protecting our natural environment as a social cause as being something that is, uh, uh, th that is congruent, something we'd expect to do. So again, not a problem there for Patagonia, very good for them to have that as their, uh, their social purpose. And in fact, this is just one of them. Um, you know, if you look on the Australian site now, they're looking at keeping gas out of the Great Australian Bite. Again, that's something that would, that would work well with their customers, something that's actually probably expected um, of them now, given the stance that they often make uh, around social purpose. This next page, I probably need to give you some context. So this is from the UK from, I think it was 2018. The context is that the police in the UK over a 40 year period had a specific unit whose job was to infiltrate um, political activist organizations um, in order to gain um, insight information. 
that included things like animal welfare, welfare organizations and, and so on. It also meant that they went as far as forming relationships with people in that um, and also perhaps even having children, um, which has been alleged. Now, there was a, um, an inquiry launched into that, but the inquiry has been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. So this retailer, and I have to tell you, this retailer is, uh, is Lush, one of my favorite retailers, a great retailer, um, both here and, uh, and in the UK. Um, in the UK, they put this, this up in, their, in the front of their, uh, their shops. And it was all about spy cops. It was all about bringing that particular, um, particular cause to the fore to try and push for, um, for some movement, I suppose, um, in bringing forward, forward that inquiry. Now, there was a great backlash to this particular uh, to a particular activity um, to the extent that the Home Secretary said that the company was against uh, the police. People in the stores were being harassed. Um, social media, people were telling people to stop uh, buying in the store and so on. So it had a really big um, negative impact. Now, I know that the brand is very happy to have pushed this to the fore. Um, as I say, I really strongly like this, this brand and it is a cause worth um, worth pushing, but was it right for an organization that is a cosmetics company um, uh, to, to, to do so? Well, maybe not when we look at the, uh, the requirements in health and, uh, and beauty, and we see that it's one of the human rights down there ringed is one of the lower um, categories, if you like, of, of social purpose that we would expect of a health and beauty organization. So partly I think this, uh, this cause, whilst, whilst worthy, jarred with those people who were ex weren't expecting to see it there as a uh, as a cause in lush um, and perhaps reduction in packaging healthy living um, healthy body image even might have been something that, that that was more expected and therefore less likely to have caused that that particular backlash and that comes through in our research you can see here that uh, that almost 60 percent of us believe that um, the social cause should align with the category um, that we are in uh, a majority as well think that we should make sure that we engage with our employees, that we seek out our customers' views when um, actually deciding on the social purpose that we, that we have. And 55% importantly believe that um, we should make it a long-term commitment and that potentially, I suppose, um, would uh, mitigate against the idea that, well, are you really serious about this, which is what we've, we heard earlier on. And then there's a piece around 53% saying, well, if you've got a social purpose, tell me about it. Um, I think you should regularly communicate um, to uh, us um, about what your social purpose uh, is. People prefer to be, um, to be communicated to on uh, the website, for example, um, and in innovative ways. Don't just sort of give us bland information, but give us uh, case studies on things that you've done and so on. And who should we have um, as the uh, spokesperson? Well, it comes through loud and clear here that existing customers and current employees are absolutely more likely to be, be believed as vehicles of, of, of getting the message out um, compared to celebrities or paid actors or even the CEO of the, uh, of the company. So I might just wrap up there. There is obviously more in the report, so I do recommend that you download it, but just some learnings that we've got. Although only 4% of um, those 5,500 people that we uh, surveyed said that it's the most important, that social um, purpose is the most important thing in the decision-making process of where to shop, but 59% of people engage with social purpose. And 77% of Gen Z do, 70% of Gen Y do. So um, younger generations, those less than 40 broadly, are much more likely to engage with social purpose. So if that's where your, um, your category aims, um, then it's important that you uh, also um, look to social purpose. Make sure it aligns with your category though. Um, communicate it often and communicate it authentically. Commit for the long term. And keep an eye on that price premium, because although we know that, um, uh, that over half of us will pay more uh, for a product bought from an organization with a social purpose, we won't pay that much more. And often we will, we will bulk at it and, uh, and go elsewhere if we're not careful. 
I said earlier on uh, that uh, questions uh, arise out of research. I'm, I, I'm always, uh, well, actually unsurprised now that when we receive the results back from our, from our research, there's always a, oh, I wonder why that is. Um, so I'm really pleased that we have um, a couple of absolute experts um, in, this, uh, in this topic with us. Um, and so what I like to do now is just to uh, have a talk with Andrew Davies. Andrew, as I said, is the CEO of B Lab here in Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Um, introducing me as an expert, but I have about a million questions on that uh, um, <laughs> presentation. Really deeply interesting findings, and um, yeah, I look forward to to investigating a lot more from that. Real, really interesting material. Well, let's have a good conversation, mate. But first, look, I'm, I introduced um, B, uh, B Lab with a sort of a, a one line introduction. Um, I'm not sure I did that justice. So please tell us a little bit more, uh, Andrew, about um, B Lab, its mission, and what it does. Sure. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, look, our vision at B Lab is for an inclusive, equitable, and regenerative economic system for all people on the planet. And we start with the proposition that the current economic system and driven by business as really one of its key actors um, is not meaning its enormous promise to create positive impact and it is in fact creating many significant negative impacts. And I don't think that proposition itself is, is very challenging. Um, as an organisation, we started in the US in 2007, opening up in our region in 2013. We operate as a global network, so each B Lab is an independent organisation, and I look after Australia and Aotearoa and New Zealand. And we're best known for certifying B Corporations, as you introduced, or, or B Corps. And B Corps are businesses that meet the highest standards of social and environmental performance. Um, so they measure and manage their impact across their environmental footprint, um, their local community impact, their workers. Um, but we also look into their business models, how they impact customers and their governance models, which are a really crucial part of, of managing impact. B Corps are then certified by us, so they're verified against their standards through a very rigorous process that takes an awfully long time. But the point of it is to make sure that their uh, practices actually match their promises. And look, our, our mission is to really change the system that we work in. So we're a creature of the system. We work with business. But we operate on three levels to create change. We look to change the behaviour of business with the tools and the programs that we offer. We also look to change the conversation around the role of business. So we're in that cultural change space where we really try and show people that the last 50 years under the, the sort of Milton Friedman doctrine is a relatively recent year of the responsibility of business and that that can change. And then lastly, we work in structural change. So we look at uh, how the, the legal structures that underpin modern business, so the modern corporation, can also be changed to, to create the, the overall system change that we're looking to achieve. While you've been saying that, Andrew, I've been thinking back to the to the research and um, the piece that said only I think eleven percent of of people actually believe uh, people when they say this is my social purpose that, that that the majority are either ambivalent or actually disagree and think well actually you're only in it for the money really this is just um, just there as an extra way of of, of you um, making more money as opposed to having a proper social social purpose. Do you find that with some of some of the people that you work with, and, and does B Lab help to mitigate against that? Well, yes, by definition, a, a certification. Um, so there's other examples like fair trade for coffee or organic. Um, they exist in order for a business to be accountable and to counter whether it's greenwashing or purpose washing or pink washing. There's lots of different forms of it. But I think a healthy approach to cynicism is really important to hold business to account. But it also needs to be matched with a recognition that some of this change is really hard and the best thing an employee in particular, but also a consumer can do, and we all wear those hats, is to support businesses who are trying to be better um, and look into their commitments. I think, quite frankly, businesses that are engaged in very blatant greenwashing are going to get held to account awfully quickly in the current world that we live in. Yes, so don't take it for granted and just uh, just agree with what's what you read on the website or see in the window, but actually look for uh, examples of that happening in real life. So um, 
it sounded that like, as if as if it's a fairly rigorous process to become a um, a, a B Corp. Um, how long does it take, Andrew? What 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 are the the main processes that they, that they go through, and and is there a cost involved too? Look, there is. There's a there's an annual fee that you need to pay us. The how long question has a lot more to do with the current state of your business and where you need to get it to. So yes, there's a there's a rigorous audit process that can take six to twelve months working directly with us, but the real work is in re-engineering your business. So let me maybe take it back just one step. Um, so certifications, as I mentioned, they're a very they're increasingly common. They're a great way to confirm that a business stacks up. And those ones that I mentioned, like Fair Trade Organic, tend to be quite focused on a product. The distinction with B Corp is that it looks at the whole business. It looks at the entire value chain and the structures underpinning the business. So it is by definition a more comprehensive process, but it builds on those certifications so that you can earn credits for having other certifications in place. So you have to meet these performance standards and really that's done all through our B Impact Assessment Platform, which is a free tool for any business to use. And that measures how well you're aligned to our standards across those different categories. So again, looks at your governance, your environmental footprint, your workers' policies and practice, your local community impact. The questions range from looking at the policies you, you have in place to the practices and to the actual business model itself. Once you achieve a certain benchmark score, you can then apply to get certified by us. So we go through that verification process. There are two other elements. You also need to meet a legal requirement. So we require all B Corps to actually amend their foundational documents, which in now part of the world is usually a company constitution, to embed a commitment to achieve an overall public benefit alongside profit and to consider stakeholders in your decision making. And what that is about is about creating alignment between management, boards and shareholders. And yes, sometimes that's the same person in a really small business. But that alignment is really important because these decisions get challenging in the gray areas. And what we're trying to do is empower management, the people actually running a business, to be able to make a decision for the long term and to know that their board is in support and in turn that the board is supported by their shareholders. And that's really an important structural change that we're looking to achieve. So all B Corps have made that change as part of becoming certified. And then lastly, Jerry, uh, there's a commitment to transparency. So you need to, your, your high level results are published on a global directory of B Corps as well. So it sounds to me like people don't come to you and say, look, we've got it all sorted, sign us up now and give us our certification. And that happens the next day. It's much more of a journey for them. So what tends to drive people to come to, to you and at what, what stage do they come? Is it right at the beginning? I actually don't know what my social purpose should be. I, I need some help. I think it's important. I don't know what it is. Or do they have an idea of what that purpose is and then um, come to you partway down the, down the line, knowing that it's important to them, but wanting to, um, to really embed it further in their organization? Look, it is more that latter scenario. Um, and the biggest driver that companies come to us with is a desire to hold themselves to account. So to actually assess their own performance against some benchmarks. Um, and they do that to send a message, not just to their customers, but also to their business partners, their suppliers, their employees, and their investors. And that accountability is really baked into the certification because it gives you an ongoing requirement to recertify every three years. Now, when a business decides it wants to be accountable, um, does depend on where it's at with its cycle. And I think it's fair to say that if a business is just grappling with some of the information you've shared and thinking about how can we better organize our business, there is a, a process to go through, but nothing stops you from taking that assessment, getting that baseline sense of where am I performing? And a good example is for a small consulting practice, maybe working out of a co-work space, to, to redesign your environmental footprint is probably not all that hard. Um, one of your biggest changes could be to make a conscious decision to travel less or offset more emissions um, and to go to your co workspace and say, hey, can we switch to green power because that'll help me with my assessment. Mm -hmm. But for a big manufacturing business to switch to renewables is more of a process in redesigning a supply chain or a company looking to re-establish um, relationships with overseas suppliers and we've reached a fascinating stage where not that long ago, the accepted wisdom was the longer your supply chain, the smarter you were in business. And that whole has changed so much in the last two years. But redesigning a supply chain is complex. So there's a lot 
more work to be done in that space. So I think much depends on both the type of business and where you're at. So really what we're, what you're, you're saying is that, that you offer a tool which says, hey, where, where do you sit currently? And that's a free tool that people can go to your website and look for. And I, and I'm, and I know there's many, much more on, the, on your website as well that can help people on this journey. Um, but then after that, once they, once they know and are, co are committed, it's almost you, you work with them to, to uh, move them towards certification using the tools that, that, that you have. So if they don't know what to do, um, then you give them a, a, a framework for, for that. Is that right? Yeah, spot a framework is a great language for it. So it's like an architecture for business. Mm -hmm. And we constantly get feedback too that but getting certified is not just a point in time when you then stop. Um, Patagonia is one of um, the best known B Corps globally and has been certified for an awfully long time. And after every three years when they have to recertify, they then build a project plan that says, well, what are the areas of the assessment that we can perform better in? And what are the changes to our business we can now make to improve our performance? But interestingly, they do then something else as well. They actually turn around and say, in our opinion, where could the standards that B Lab adopts be improved? And they give us feedback that says, hey, for instance, they've been exploring a new agricultural standard called regenerative organic, where they say organic production is not enough. Um, it needs to go to the next level, which is the practice. It should both be organic, so fewer chemicals, but also should be designed to improve the soil, which is that regenerative layer. They're working with another B Corp called Dr. Bronner's in developing that standard. And then they turn around to us and say, hey, you need this standard in your standards um, to improve everybody's practices. So there's real scope to work to create change on a bigger level as well. And that comes from businesses doing things differently. So much innovation in this broad space in the last decade has come from businesses doing things differently and then finding ways to share that. And I think that's really, um, it gives me cause for a lot of optimism in, in a very difficult time in the world. Thank you. And I like the way that, that you're learning from those people that you've, you've certified to keep your, yourselves uh, current, uh, really. I'm going to put my um, sort of sceptical hat on again, if I if I may. And we, we heard earlier on that that, that some people don't believe in um, in the purpose that someone has. Um, what what is there that that um, in terms of governance and and so on that makes them feel that that actually a B Lab uh, uh, sort of certification is something that I should rely on as well? How does how does B Lab hold itself to, to account? It's a great question, um, Jerry and. Look, we have formal processes for the way in which our standards are developed. Um, there's a global advisory council informed by regional groups as well. Um, the standards are currently going through a major review. A good example is we've found that in the last two or three years, there's been huge shifts in the idea of emissions management. Um, we're even moving past already in many businesses, the idea of net zero commitments to actually commitments to shift to renewables, which sounds a bit like the same thing, but one is a promise and the other one is action. Um, they're both important. Businesses committing to net zero sends a really important signal to investors in the energy space that there will be more demand for renewables and offsets. But businesses actually committing to shift to renewables gives even more certainty and is a concrete action. Now, that is a good example of something that has happened so rapidly in the last few years that our standards have to shift to keep up with that. And that's a real challenge we face in a world that's moving very, very fast, particularly in that environmental sector where the standards are shifting so quickly. So we do have constant work to do to evolve them and to meet those expectations. But we also say to businesses, our standards are an, obje an objective framework. They do modify according to your business, but that doesn't mean they're perfect. Um, you might be doing something in your business that is truly innovative that we haven't come across yet. And it's important for us to recognize that because we want to honor those businesses doing things to a whole new level. Because again, that innovation creates opportunities for other businesses to follow as well as for our standards to improve. Hmm. Thank you. One last question for you, Andrew, before we move to uh, Abdullah, um, who I know is a, is a, is a B Corp. So um, it's been through your, uh, your rigorous process here. Um, it, just in terms of, of any tips or recommendations that you'd have for anyone on the call really about communicating to customers about their social purpose. 
Yeah, look, I mean, we are seeing a world in crisis at the moment. Um, it's across a pandemic, climate crisis. For many years, we've seen the instability coming from growing inequality and particularly in economies in Latin America, we've seen real disruption from that rising inequality. Um, it's often spoken of as the sort of quiet crisis that people don't see the immediate impacts from. Um, and at times like this, people look to institutions to solve problems. Um, historically, it was probably more the church and government, but increasingly, particularly employees are looking to their business, their employer, to be part of solutions and consumers are very much the same. So we're seeing, I think, quite a fundamental shift in the role of business. Um, and there's a growing expectation that it's just as important um, where you stand, you know, what are the issues that you're engaging? You, you outlined some really interesting examples earlier with, with campaigns that fit quite nicely with a business and one with Lush that maybe sat a bit awkwardly, but I'm guessing that that was a very important cause for perhaps either the employees or the owners or the investors or the management team in that business. And I think we're really seeing a fundamental shift in the expectation that businesses have to stand for something. We've also seen that, I should say, in, in the unfolding war in the Ukraine, where we've seen businesses uh, preemptively pull out of Russia. Um, now, economic sanctions are a very complicated area um, to navigate in terms of their impact. They're very destructive. But I think it's the first time in history we've seen such a comprehensive response um, and engagement by business without necessarily saying everyone's doing the right thing. Hmm. So to come to your question, though, sorry, I get overexcited. Um, but some tips and recommendations for businesses. Uh, look, there's a huge amount to unpack in the data that you've just shared, and we all love to be led by data. Um, but I'll go a little bit high level. I'd say number one always is be authentic. Focus on something that you and your business can actually impact meaningfully um, and be realistic about your role in that impact. Um, you might be really passionate about it, but your business might only be able to create a little bit of change and that's fine. I think when businesses overreach with their promises, that is not authentic. The second one I'd say is be humble, um, recognize others, including other businesses might be better than you and learn from them and express a willingness to learn from them. It, it goes to being authentic as well, but the more you acknowledge the things you're not good enough yet in your own eyes, um, the more people appreciate the fact that you're trying to be better. And lastly, I'd say be accountable. So find a mechanism, whether it's something as comprehensive as B Corp certification um, or other ways, find a mechanism to hold yourself to account because we know this feels great when it's all working, but when you're confronted by a new situation or a, um, you, you need to have other mechanisms to hold you to account to really stick to the path. Uh, stick to the path. So for me, be authentic, be humble and be accountable. Be authentic, be humble, be accountable. Love it. Thank you very much, Andrew. Really appreciate your time. Um, so I imagine that the number of people using your Be Impact tool will, will jump after this. Um, and uh, I encourage everybody to jump onto the um, uh, onto the B Corp website and just to learn more. There's a, a wealth of information there. Um, let's move now, though, to talk to Abdullah Rame. Uh, Abdullah is the chief executive, as I said before, of Pablo and Rusty's um, Coffee Roasters. Um, mainly a wholesaler, Abdullah, but I know I've had um, I've had uh, coffee at one of your um, your outlets here in Sydney, and I think you've got one up in Brisbane as uh, as well. Um, well. Welcome. Tell us a little bit more about Pablo and Rusty's. Great to be here. And firstly, what an amazing presentation! A lot of insights, and I definitely learned a lot from it. So Pablo and Rusty's Coffee Roasters, as the name says, um, we work in coffee and uh, we exist to make a positive impact uh, on people and planet through coffee. Uh, and what we really try to do is help people drink better coffee and making that more accessible. Well, one of that is through product innovation. So we do from beans to pods to concentrates to ready to drink cans. And we mean better coffee in, in, in the bigger sense of the word. So not just better quality and better customer service, which is important, but also better for you and the planet and the people involved in that, that supply chain. Um, and we, we do a, a, a few channels. As you said, we have two stores, one in, in, in Sydney, one in Brisbane. They're sort of our playgrounds to, to keep in connection with our customers that are in the wholesale uh, channel. We also have um, a lot of people that drink our coffee at home and at the offices and through various channels. Um, 
So, you know, we, we all love coffee. I love coffee. I know it's a big part of the Australian culture. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a very impactful and tasty journey. My coffee uh, machine broke the other day and I was working from home. It was just the worst thing that happened that, that day, I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. That's, that's, that's the worst thing that can happen. Like, you know, everyone has some risk levels. <laughs> if people can't make coffee, that's our highest risk level. <laughs> it, it is for us Australians, isn't it? <laughs> Um, there was one thing that, that came out in the research, Abdullah, and that uh, for, for me that, that I wanted to drill down a little bit more on, and, and that was around the cost. So we found that people are happy to um, pay more, at least 53% of us are happy to pay more, and, and um, a significant proportion of those, about a third of them are, are, are happy to pay more than 10% more. Um, and that's on the assumption that, that, that they're, they're looking at it and saying, well, there is more cost involved in, um, in being uh, or having a, a good so social purpose, uh, there's an overlay to it. Um, would you think that that's that's true? It, is is a is a company with a social purpose always one that's going to have more overheads? Uh, potentially, I, I, I think uh, th that is true because you know, uh, like Andrew was talking before, it takes dedication, certifications, uh, especially if, if you're looking at better sources of energy or carbon offsets. So for the cost is involved. I think that's, uh, that's generally true. And it is harder for, um, for purpose businesses typically because they have to, like a research shows, they have to have a great product, great service, and also then deliver on the purpose that they exist for. That being said, I think the research is quite promising. You know, 10% is, is not, a, uh, not a small amount <laughs> either. So I think sometimes what, uh, the, the, and the question is, what value are we adding to the customer? The cost is important, I think, from two point of views. One is, at what uh, point can the customer, does the customer think it's too expensive? And, and that's what your research mm -hmm. is saying that, you know, so many people are willing to pay 10% or more. And I was pleasantly surprised, I think, uh, when that cohort, it was, it was about 60% that we're going to go over that 5% mark, which is, which is amazing. Mm. Our cost is important also in the sense that th there's also an actual affordability limit. Um, so you can, you can think back to the early days of uh, electric cars and you know, when, when they were 100,000, 150,000, there's just a cohort of customers you can't reach and that's okay. Mm. But as long as you understand that as a business, so cost is very important. However, if you have a good product, and a good service and your smart business, I think you can still be in the competitive set of the customer choices and give them an and choice, not an or choice. So, you know, a cust you know, here's a option A, here's a here's a great product. Option B, here's a great product with with a social purpose. And they're relatively similarly priced, right? Within that five percent or ten percent band. And I think that's where you can really build it's great customer relationships and great businesses that are impactful. Thank you. And, and while you were talking, then I was reminded of our conversation last week about the the importance of being a you know a business and having a social purpose. That you know th this isn't about being a charity, um, and and that's 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 your main role, if if you like. This is actually. Um, adding to the business that you've that you've got in a meaningful way that resonates with your customers um have you got any more thoughts on on that uh, definitely and uh, as you know andrew you were talking about that you know business has a force of good it's still a business you know it's not government it's not a non-for-profit so all the you know you still have to have good products you have to have good management you have to have good governance you have to attract the right talent right you're you're uh, it's not a silver bullet. It's very hard when you when you give the customers an or choice or your employees an or choice. That's very different, and we have to make and choices. For example, great product, great service, and it delivers on the social purpose. Hopefully, that you value. Same thing with employees. You know, it's a great place to work at. The salaries in the competitive set, and you know, from you're spending eight hours of of every day and majority of your life doing something impactful. Now that's powerful versus saying, here's, here's a bad product <laughs> and it's, it's really expensive and it has bad service, but we are, uh, you know, we are purpose-led organizations to support us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it is a business first. Um, you have to think about customer value. You have to be on top of your game. However, yeah. uh, you can still deliver the purpose. 
yeah, I found that a fascinating distinction that I hadn't really thought about before, but uh, it, it makes a, a lot of sense and, and glad to see you living it. We talked earlier um, with Andrew uh, about what prompts or, or you know, at what point do people decide to become um, a, a B Corp? And what was it that actually um, convinced you that Pablo and Rusty should, you know, should, should have a, a, a strong social purpose and should, and beyond that, should then become a, a B Corp? I'll, I'll answer in two parts. So the, the social purpose part, we, you know, early on, we've been in business for about 15 years. I've been here for about 11. And, and the founder, the early team, they were all very, um, you know, they were passionate about ethical business. We were all passionate about ethical business and also the environment. And the environment part also comes to because we like outdoor activities, but also because coffee is very sensitive to the environment. So we like coffee and coffee is very sensitive to climate change. So we always were, you know, we, we don't want, you know, it, it just seems very bizarre to, to spend your life eight, 10 hours a day doing something that's only money uh, motivated. Now money is important, you have to pay bills, but you know, why not make money and do something purposeful? So that was the drive behind it. And our, our philosophy was that, you know, th that sort of goes into three things. One is that we are an ethical business and, um, and we, you know, we, 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 we look to be better in, in all, all, all areas, especially when it comes to procurement. And that comes, you know, some of coffee is fair, is fair trade. Uh, others, we have long-term partnerships at farm, making sure there's, there's a lot of good happening, making sure that there's, uh, uh, we're minimizing and eliminating modern slavery. We are partnering with, you know, farmers and origins that are doing great things, that are doing regenerative agriculture, doing all these great things and other procurement also. So that's about, um, that's one. And the second is uh, doing, minimizing our harm, right? So uh, when we, a business exists, when all of us exist, we have a carbon footprint. And we became carbon uh, a carbon neutral organization to do that, want to monitor and calculate where the carbon is coming from and improve it and what we can't eliminate um, to offset it. And, and the last part it was to do more good. And that's where we, you know, about a year ago, we became a one person for the planet member. And that means 1% of every single, you know, uh, and this is related to cost because 1% of every single dollar of sale we make of revenue, not profit, uh, goes back into four planet causes. So the idea is first, you know, reducing our harm, but now actually doing good. And as we grow, hopefully that good grows. And early on about five, six years ago, uh, we, what we do as a leadership team is we read a book or listen to a book every every month or so. And one of the books we, we read was Let Our People Go Surfing, which is from Ivan Chouinard, uh, who is yep. one of the founders of Patagonia. And that at the same time, we're really discussing this idea that, you know, like you and Andrew were saying that, you know, your fair trade and you have all these certifications that are product specific or safety specific, what's there to say that a business is ethical, right? And firstly, for us, it was a, a measuring stick for ourselves. And it was a humbling experience, uh, to be honest, um, because, you know, just because we're for purpose, we're not perfect. And I say this all the time, we have a lot to improve on. However, we're on a journey. Um, and so we came across B Corps and that was like, you know, this is what we're looking for. It, it's, it's, it allows us to measure ourselves. And we've had two, two certifications. <laughs> so we, we, when we first started, I think the minimum uh, score is 80. And, and we actually think that most businesses should eventually want to get to a place where most businesses score that because we think even though it's rigorous, but I, we, we just think that's the minimum, uh, should be the minimum standard. And we scored like 81 or 80 point something. And then we, we recertified recently and we are at 89 point something. And our goal is by 2025 to become a hundred points or, or more. So it, one, it, it gives us a yardstick to move, to, to sort of really look at where we can improve when it comes to our employees, our governance, our customers, our environment, our community. And also it gives that confidence to our employees that, you know, a lot of people join our company and, and they're always skeptical, right? Just like customers are skeptical, like, do you, are we really, are we real, are, are we for real or are we just making these claims? So uh, that's really to say, no, actually we are, and we are going to have an external body come in and assess this for us. Um, mm -hmm. And, and again, then for customers too, I think uh, skepticism of customers, as hard as it is, I think it's warranted. And 
Uh, that's why we're, we're big we're big fans of certifications because I think the mo this the whole purpose for purpose movement will be set back a lot if people lose confidence in it and to give people confidence and our customers confidence our investors confidence and our uh, employees confidence you need that external validation and given that you have you have two stores but that you're now predominantly a, a wholesaler um, then you're essentially selling through through so, you know, someone else do you, do you find that the um, the whole or the, the the businesses that you're going to share your um, your enthusiasm and therefore they start to get on the the, the, the journey to becoming a B Corp as well or at least having a, a social purpose uh, definitely and we, we do a bit of both so I think about 30 percent of our business actually comes from direct to customer which is mm -hmm. uh, B2C and then the rest is B2B and uh, uh, there's no research but anecdotally the I think the um, your, your findings of the report sort of anecdotally feel right where it's not the predominant reason they're doing business with us. We we work really hard to have really good product and really good service at a competitive price. However, when we give them an and, hey, you know, this all lines up and you're, you're helping you know, us, us do this change and, and even around Christmas and so forth, instead of giving them gifts for our B2B customers, we typically plant trees for them, for example. So we do these small things. Um, so a, a few of them have, have become or are uh, social purpose organizations. Some have become B Corp. Um, others are on their own environmental journey. Uh, however, that's you know very. There's a few of them. I think ten to fifteen percent that came to us specifically for our um, purpose led credentials, and everyone else came to us because we have really good coffee and service at a good price. <laughs> Excellent, and I, and I hadn't appreciated this, but if I go to your website, I can I can buy your coffee, can I? You definitely can, and we've actually just relaunched a new website uh, with the idea of, and one of the key, um, we did some research on our own with our customers, and you know we designed it in the sense that you know you're there, you can buy coffee, and it's coffee first, but then there's subtle hints of that we are B Corp and we're one person for the planet and we're carbon neutral. And even the idea of, you know, as people are checking out to let them know, hey, you know, we've offset this purchase with this or 1% of this is going to uh, to saving the planet, so forth. So not to be in people's face. And that was one of the, uh, you know, however, letting them engage and seeing some of this insights, I think, validate that team's um, uh, reasons for doing that. And I think that fits well with the research that 59% of people engage with it. I mean, 14% of it will, will look it out and probably come to you for that, but the others will engage with it um, but just by coming across it on your website. So if you've made it come to the fore on your website, then that, that makes sense, doesn't it, to engage with the, the, the rest of that 59%. Just one last question for you, um, and, it, and it's kind of similar to the, the question that I, um, I asked Andrew, and that's you know tips for other businesses um, around embedding sustainability and social purpose within their organisation. What would you um, advise people on the on the uh, on the webinar? So, the first thing is purpose led is quite big and abstract. So, out of the the slide you had, which had broken it down into more causes within it. I think it's good to abstract things are very hard and business could also yeah. end up doing a lot and, and business only have so much energy. So it's good to pick a cause that, um, and, and I echo Andrew here, that, that, that fits with the customer, but also you are yourself passionate about and your employees are passionate about. Yeah. Because one of the, I think, and this is very evident in the younger generations is we're looking for a search of meaning and, and, and purpose yeah. in our lives in general. And work is where we spend a lot of our time. So it's okay to have a purpose in it for you as a as a as a as an employee or a manager or investor or a founder or an owner. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, ideally, you can you can then make sure that purpose also fits your category and customers, so you have a sustainable business. Yeah. Um, so, and that also means so. Number one is choose you know choose something you're passionate yeah. about and your employees and customers are passionate about. Uh, and that'll come to number two is that be be in it for the long haul. Um, it is a uh, and that was one of the insights from the report too, is that and when you've chosen something you're actually passionate about and your employees are, it just makes it easy to to see it through. It, it yeah. means it and, and and you get that authenticity and being genuine, and and just start. It's okay, right? And there's a lot of people here to help 
uh, the, the community from B Lab to everyone else that's involved. Um, you know, even though we're competitive, we're very happy to see our peers as well as other people come join this for because we're in it, you know, uh, the, the, everyone benefits and ultimately, you know, the, the, our seven generations later benefits by businesses being more ethical and, um, and purpose-led. So to recap Perfect. that, you know, choose something, uh, be in it for the long haul and just start. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. I think the uh, the gods are telling us it's time to uh, uh, to to wrap up. Thank you for your uh, for your your advice there. You know, start being it for the lo for the long haul. Choose a cause. Um, thank you also to Andrew. You know, be authentic, be humble, uh, and be accountable. Um, thank you both for your uh, for your insights. That was fantastic. Thank you everyone else for joining us. Please do uh, jump on to the Pablo and Rusty's website, brand new, um, and uh, and and look at the uh, the fantastic copies that you can buy there. Please do jump on to B Lab um, just to un uh, to uh, look at all the fantastic resources that they have about you um, driving your your social purpose further within your or or organization. And please um, to uh, just. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've just seen a message come through that I think I think Jerry's meeting room just reduced emissions. I think that's probably true. Thanks, everybody. Please do, if you need any more advice from us, contact uh, your specialist consumer banker or your relationship executive, and please do download the, uh, the report from our website. Have a good day. Bye-bye.